that drive through takes away from the sidewalk, it still allows us to have something for the kids to stand on while waiting for their parents. Oh, yeah, well, there should be a sidewalk where they drop them off. Mm -hmm. right, I agree. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Black. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Height asked my question. Okay, Councillor Brown. I just a uh, uh, question, I, and I'm, my mother lives on the corner of Jones, right across from, and I know uh, I've seen the cars backed up from the fence, or parked along that street, but it's just an urban residential street, so um, when the kids come out of the school, do they come through the yard and out, out is there a gate on that side? Of the fence? Right where uh, you can see a little path coming from I kind mean, of the paved area good. into the red circle. Yeah. That is a very small pathway with one, you know, one person fence entrance. So, and you want to bring that sidewalk up to where, uh, right to the end of the fence, say. Eh? So then what happens there, they, like, I, I've seen it, I know what you mean by the cars parked there. And they go all the way around, do they not? Does it, to the school? Do they park? What's the street going? At the end, I, I lost track of the Anderson, name. Anderson, at the top. Anderson, yeah. So do they park all along one side of that? I can't recall. Our buses are on that side, come in that side. So we don't have any children being dismissed other than busers through that side of the school right now. We have kinders that go out the parking lot, the parking lot side, and then everybody else is dismissed out this, through this side. Okay, and where, are there going to be more portables put in? Ten. And where are they, where are they going? So, from what we've been told, from what we've been told, yeah. the ten portables will be here at the top here at Anderson in the corner. and Rutherford. They will be plopped there in um, a soccer field. Okay. Okay, so the, uh, at dismissal, I can see where, wow, you're going to... And then they're going to, as... What we've been told is that there will be extra um, teacher parking here in the, where the kids play. Okay. So the, uh, the west side of Rutherford is where they want the sidewalk to the end of the fence, in, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And, and they will come out through that opening, a lot of them, and, and you want to be able to stand on that sidewalk and wait to get picked up. Mm -hmm. Also, Boy. they come out through here. Yeah. Because this is... It's open. It's open between the house and the road. Right. So then they cross over the street here. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that. What, so, like, it's, I've seen it. It's crowded there now on that street. Yes. So when you get another, what would you say, 250? 250 children. Yes. Wow. Wow. But you think they'll all be bussed from there, not additional cars then? No. I, you know, just because you're offered a bus or you missed the bus or doesn't mean your parents aren't going to drive you instead of having you bust or they're right. going to have them walk down or there's not everybody's going to be on that bus right so there might be a need for more absolutely yeah okay thank you okay any more questions councilor wells thank you mr chair just a quick question during your presentation at least once if not twice you mentioned that the neighbors were quite supportive of the sidewalk as long as it didn't go beyond the fence. Yes. Could you explain that, please? Um, they do not want their front yards taken from them. They don't want a sidewalk. Uh, a lot of them um, didn't want to have to do snow removal. <laughs> and they didn't want the sidewalk to go through their front yards. Nor are we asking no. for it to go any further than the fence. But will the children walk by their properties? Most, most walkers that would go in that direction, yes. So they'd at least be able to get to the sidewalk at the end of your, right by the house there on this, and be able to get into the, the street and walk like normal. But at least they can get past the congestion and get back to normal So living. you're not quite as concerned about the safety once they get past the fence well. as you are before they get to the fence? Mm -hmm. um, there is, a, our yard goes all the way down. So kids who walk, that end down to man quite often cut through the field if they're going down to man or over to the other side there's playground and there's a soccer field they go in through their backyards there is they're safe walking that way and there's crossing guards on those sides of the streets okay. thank you mr chair and thank you for your thanks okay <laughs> doesn't look like there's any more questions I need a mover and a seconder to receive the deputation, Mayor Luke and
Councilor Sonnenberg, that we receive the deputation of Vicki Trowbridge and Megan Allen regarding the Lindale Heights uh, sidewalk issue. Those in favor? That is carried. Thank you. You may be seated, ladies. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for coming forward with this issue regarding children's safety. Yes, Councilor Black. Chairman Columbus, uh, I, I wonder, this seems to require a staff report, and I'm, it seems to be bigger than just a sidewalk. L listening, you know, I was aware that there's going to be all this restructuring, but now here's the implications of it. And um, th this is a huge change in that area where there's already a problem with safety. So I'm wondering if we should ask staff to maybe get together with the Grand Erie Board and find out exactly what's happening and how we could work together to make that area as safe as possible. Maybe there's more to it than just the sidewalk. And at this moment, I'm thinking that there might be. So I'm suggesting that we ask staff to communicate with Grand Erie and come back with a, a report of their findings and their uh, recommendations. I mean, the sidewalk would be one, of course, and then if there's anything else that would uh, improve that that area uh, for the safety of the kids in the long term. So I don't know if I, I would make that a motion or if you'd receive it okay, as such. I will accept it. I'm going to ask the deputy clerk to read it back, but I need a seconder. Councilor Sonnenberg seconds that. And, uh, Deputy Clerk, if you could please read that motion back as best as you can. She's just fine-tuning it here. So it should, should be coming back in a timely manner. I don't know exactly when, but, I mean, there's some urgency to this because it's going to be happening soon. Yes, Lee? Uh, to the Chairman, to Council, um, I just, if the motion is crafted in that fashion, um, we're not going to be able to do anything or address anything for September. I, I want to make sure that council understands that um, in order to, we, we're certainly, staff are certainly happy to work with the board, but to work with the board and do all of those types of things, they will have, their staff will then have to take a report to their board to get approval to, to go through all of this. Their board um, will start, their summer hiatus sort of the end of June. Um, we are the beginning of May now. Um, they're going into a two-month, they'll be in a two-month hiatus. By the time that comes back, we have the very real possibility of being lame duck here, which wouldn't allow this council to do anything. We will be December if that motion goes forward. Okay, then maybe what I should have asked, I should have been smart enough to ask staff what their thoughts are on an appropriate recommendation or a motion. To, to get going on this and address some of the concerns. So, Lee, what do you think? Uh, through the mayor, or sorry, through the chairman uh, to council, um, if you just refer it back to a staff report, we're well aware of all of the timing okay. and we'll get it, we'll get a fit in and we'll have something back to council in June. All right, um, the, then so let's, let's make it, make it that it way and I appreciate, appreciate Lee's comments on that. Okay, so you're withdrawing your motion? Well, I'm not withdrawing, yeah, I'm withdrawing the one that's been written down and then we're gonna go with Lee's suggestion. Deputy Clerk's got something crafted. Uh, through the chair, the motion would essentially be that staff be directed to prepare and present a report to council respecting the deputation in June of 2018. Okay. So that, that's, do we need a mover and a seconder? Councillor Black moves that. Councillor Sonnenberg seconds it. Okay. And uh, those in favor? Oh, discussion, sorry. Go ahead, Mayor Luce. Mr. Chair, I, I'm going to try to keep you on your toes tonight. Good. Uh, no, I just want to say that I certainly will support the motion because without it, there will be no improvement there, whatever means. However, as my experience in the past, the sidewalk on Donnelly Drive in front of the school and even extending north beyond Lindale Road was put there of a request of the first principal of that school Back in 1970, 78, September of 78, Betty Cheney and the parents group. And other sidewalks we've been involved with have generally speaking been requested initially from students or parents groups. 
a sidewalk on county property, we know who's going to pay for that. It's our property. It's county property. So it's, it's our ball game to decide if we're putting a sidewalk there or not. Uh, the board is not the board of education isn't in the sidewalk business. So somebody can tell me when they've paid for a sidewalk on our property. Never heard of it. I'm not saying that we don't contact the board, and the ultimate solution may be very well exactly what these ladies are requesting. Because the school is here, it's here to stay, and. It is not unusual, as Mr. Chair, we know that's on Anderson, a sidewalk on the edge of a school boundary where many, many kids are most of the year, morning and night. Uh, Donnelly. And it is not an unreasonable request, in my opinion, and I know that it's safety and it's dollars, but it's not unusual to see a sidewalk on the situation that we have on Rutherford where Many of the students enter that school playground in the morning and leave at night off of Rutherford. So we've got to do something. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? You all understand the, uh, the motion, so recommendation. Uh, those in favor? That is carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for bringing this uh, issue forward. And we'll move on to reports. Our first report is uh, the one consent item. We're going to page five. Councillor Black, this is the one uh, staff report 18-53 on page five, the Norfolk Heritage Committee designation. Go ahead. Well, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, be able to speak to it. Uh, as as uh, council's representative on the Heritage Committee, and um, hopefully everyone has read the details of it. Um, I think the report was very well done. Um, Doan's Hollow Cemetery, if anybody has been by it, um, has a very interesting architectural feature uh, called the Witch's Gate, and um, there's some historical significance to that and historical significance to a lot of the individuals that are buried in that cemetery uh, uh, representing some of the history of Port Dover itself going back to um, you know the late 1700s so I just wanted to, to say that uh, um, the, the Heritage Committee um, and uh, the uh, crafter of the report Mary Cahill she, I think she did an excellent job on this it was well organized and uh, full of uh, documented Norfolk County history. So it's, I guess, just uh, praising the committee for bringing this forward and uh, Mary Cahill for actually doing their report. Okay, thank you for that. Any further discussion? Okay, you all have the, uh, the report at your fingertips on page five. I'm just gonna call the, uh, the vote, those in fit. Do I need a, did I get a mover and a seconder? No. Mover and a seconder. Black and Brunton. Okay, move for a second. Those in favor of the recommendation, that is carried, thank you. Now we'll move to page 39 of the agenda package. And this is with respect to domiciliary hostile purchase of service agreements and operating standards. Ms. Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna ask Ms. Givens to present this report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The purpose of this report is threefold. There's three components we're looking for direction and approval. The first is to renew the purchase of the service agreements with our existing four domiciliary hostel operators. The second item is to approve the amended operating standards for the program in accordance with ministry requirements. And the third is to gain council direction to start the appropriate procurement process in the spring of this year to increase the number of domiciliary hostel providers uh, within our service manager area. And this request is uh, based explicitly on the council approved CHIPI uh, program review that we completed um, to expand the number of options currently available for our individuals experiencing or at risk of homelessness. 
In terms of the operating standards, we have updated them slightly. Again, this is based on the program review that we completed. So applications would come through our office first to be reviewed for eligibility and to ensure the matching with the appropriate provider and uh, streamlining improving customer service. For our existing participants in the program, there will be no change. People in the program will stay there until they are no longer eligible or leave the program. So with that, I can answer any questions. Questions to Tricia, uh, Council Broughton, then Luke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very quickly, on page 42, under financial services comments, uh, Norfolk, can staff answer what the, I'm not clear what that means. I think they're trying to tell me something there, but I really don't understand what it means. And maybe uh, I assume that's James's department that made those comments, did they not? Hey, uh, through the chair, I, I missed the first part of your question. Is that your question around the financial services comments? Yes. Okay, so what they're, they're speaking of is for the total amount of allocated funds that we received from the Ministry of Housing yep. for this program, we have earmarked, uh, it's actually a total of 150000 to run the domiciliary it's actually the Housing with Related Supports program. So they're indicating that there's sufficient funds to fund those currently in the program, as well as to look to new uh, partner agencies. Well, what does, uh, I guess I'm, I'm not clear. It says in that page 42, as the current services diminish over time, the program will move to new guidelines under the housing blah, blah, blah. Well, does that something is there money or something going to disappear there is that what that means through I, the chair I, so what that means is for individuals in currently in the program receiving their their subsidy as they come out of the program we will reallocate those funds so that somebody applying into the program can expand on their so right now there's four options we want to expand the opportunity for folks to find other options more appropriate based on their needs. Well, I guess I'm still not clear. I, miss, I must be missing something. I, 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 the $150,000, $10,000 is going to administration, I take? Through the chair, the administrative dollars come from the total 1.4 and change million dollars that come in for this program. The allocated funds for this specific component of all of the suite of CHIPI programs we run is $150,000. Of that, components are currently paying for people in the program with our four existing partners. And there's a component that we've built in there where we can add new partners. So if somebody chose to go to a new location, a new provider, we could cover the cost with that new provider and not negatively impact those currently in the program. And as people come out of wherever they are, whether they pass away, move on, people could apply for that same spot or they could look at other options that we would have on a list. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mayor Luke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through to Trish. Chris, I'm just in reading page three, I had a question. Currently, uh, where we stand at the moment with this is Jarvis has three such beds. Dunville has three, and there are eight in Simcoe for a total of 14, correct? Uh, correct. Through the chair, you mentioned in this report that two of those four providers have reduced in the past the number of beds and that there is room for others to come forward. Is that fair? Correct. How many could we possibly, if there were more, how could we, how many could we increase that 14 by? Could we go to 20? Through the chair, that's what we will explore through the RFP process. So right now, in the way the domiciliary hostel program is, we pay up to $55 per day yes. for individuals in the dom hostel program. Provincially, we actually pay more than mo most other service manager areas. So we are going to explore other um, payment options with other, with other providers to try and get more bang for our buck, so to speak. So we are going to be exploring getting better efficiencies um, through this program. So, Mr. Chair, Trish, you have uh, the money would be, will be in place here until 
the end of March 2019, and in that next year, roughly, a little less than a year time frame, we have room to possibly create some more bed spaces. Yes. Optimistic? Always, yes. Thank you. Very good. Anything further to, yes, Mr. Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a statistical question, Trish, and following up on the Mayor's comment on page three where it talks about the 14 beds in those service providers and yet page two makes reference to 18 individuals providing or, or being served per month is is there a discrepancy or is how do you get 18 people in 14 beds through the chair um, it could be a statistical because we have had some people move out of the program okay. while this report was being done all right thank you Okay, anything further? No, okay, I need a mover and a seconder for the recommendation. Wells and Oliver, movers and seconders, Councilor Wells, Councilor Oliver seconds. The recommendation is printed in five paragraphs on page 39 of the agenda package. And does everybody understand the uh, recommendation? I'm gonna call the vote, those in favor? That's carried unanimously, thank you. We'll now move to uh, page 57 of the agenda. And this is a report with respect to child care fee stabilization support funding. Ms. Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be re, um, reporting on this particular report um, for Ms. Van Dyke um, and Children's Services. So the purpose of this report is to accept 100% funding from the Ministry of Education for fee stabilization and licensed child care. This is... This is part of the provincial strategy to expand access to licensed child care across the province through the creation of new licensed child care spaces and also improving accessibility and affordability. More specifically, the funding is to support licensed child care centers who are contemplating fee increases to parents in order to support their operations due to the change in minimum wage and the impact um, of that on the early childhood educators who work within the licensed child care system. Children's services staff work closely with our licensed child care centers to ensure that their centers remain financially viable um, and that the fees are affordable for families. With the approval of this report, staff will work with the centers to identify where funds are needed and to allocate the funds. If all of the funds are not needed, staff will then return the funding to the Ministry of Education. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Ms. Miranda? Mayor Luke. Well, I've read the report, and I will certainly move the recommendation. Okay. Seconder? Well, okay. Okay. I will read it. Uh, the recommendation is moved by Mayor Luke, seconded by Council Wells, that staff report HSS 18-18, Child Care Stabilization Support Funding, be received as information, and that Council accept the Child Care Fee Stabilization Support Funding from the Ministry of Education in the amount of 150000 $906, and further that the approved 2018 levy supported operating budget be amended to include $150,906 to be used for child care fee stabilization support with funding to be provided 100% from the Ministry of Education. Any questions? Those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. And now we'll move to page 65. This is the Green on Social Housing Program funding opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to ask Ms. Givens to present the following two reports on housing. Through the Chair, so to provide some context, in mid-February of this year, the province announced a program under the Green Ontario Fund, whereby they're providing up to $25 million from its carbon market proceeds towards social housing buildings with less than 100 units to um, invest in energy efficient retrofits. The program is intended to complement existing programs that were directed at larger buildings and for which uh, Norfolk and Haldeman weren't eligible because our buildings are smaller. Unlike previous programs where funding was allocated, in this instance, service managers are required or were required to apply through a business case to request funding. Uh, the service manager business cases were due on March 28th, which is actually prior to the deadline of this staff report. Um, 
So we included uh, all the requests that we, per we received from housing providers. We sent out the information as soon as we received it from to housing providers. And based on their response, we made a sub business case submission for six projects. Three with our local um, housing corporation, the, ha the Haldeman Norfolk Housing Corporation, and three for three other nonprofits. And the total request of funding was uh, $400,000. We were supposed to hear about the allocation of funds uh, the week of April 16th. Unfortunately, we have heard nothing to date. I went into the system today and there's no updates. Uh, we haven't received anything. Um, however, if we are successful in receiving any funding, the timeline is aggressive, and that's why we've requested the um, approval in anticipation of some funding so we can move forward quickly. And I also wanted to note for Council's information that in the past year, um, in order to receive funding related to housing, we've been required to apply for funding. There's been four instances of those four. We've been rejected or denied for three, and this is the fourth one. So we're hopeful that we will receive some funding this time. Ready for questions? Yes, Councillor Height. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Ms. Givens. Did I hear you correctly saying that you received this mid-February? Through the chair, yes. So then you have to scramble to get it all out to the providers, come up with a business case, and I'm assuming they're looking for quotations to have this work done. Yes, they're all shovel-ready projects. And get back to the province. Like, that's a ridiculous timeline, especially when you're looking at spending $25 million across the province. No wonder we're paying a billion dollars in interest with that kind of funding, but you, you mentioned also that two providers you were able to contact? Or were they Through the, the chair, we, we shared this information with all 11 housing providers, and from them we had uh, submissions from uh, the Haldeman Norfolk Housing Corporation, uh, as well as three other providers who would be ready to start in time. And we have a total of 11 today, I hear you say? There's six projects in the business plan. No, but how many overall? Like oh, there's there's 11 housing providers in the, in Haldeman Norfolk. Okay, and only two were interested. I guess the concerning part there was if they have a board meeting, they could have missed this entire opportunity just by the date of their board meeting. Could they not? Through the chair, um, because the Haldeman Norfolk Housing Corporation manages uh, a number of the housing providers, they made submission on behalf of two of the other three providers, um, and they were quite prepared with their lists. Most providers have lists of things they'd like to do beyond their capital plan. Um, so we were pleasantly surprised with the professional information provided from our providers. Okay, thank you. Mayor Luke, did I see your button on there? No. So I didn't know whether you had a question or not. Okay. Any further uh, questions or discussion? No. Need a mover and a seconder. Black and Oliver. <coughs> Councillor Black moves. Councillor Oliver seconds that the recommendation that staff report HSS 18 19 Green Ontario social, social Housing Program funding opportunity be received as information, and that pending the results of the Green Ontario social, social Housing Program, if all requested funds are awarded to the Haldeman Norfolk Consolidated Municipal Service Manager, each project included in the business case as submitted to the Housing Services Corporation received the requested amount. And further, that pending the results of the Green Ontario Social Housing Program, if only a portion of the requested funds are awarded to the Hullaby Norfolk Consolidated, Consolidated Municipal Service Manager, Housing Services complete a competitive selection process in order to determine the allocation of funds for those social housing providers who were included in the business case submission. If there's no further discussion, those in favor, that is carried. Thank you, and now we'll move to the next item, <clears throat> and that is Portable Housing Benefit, Special Priority Program Update on page 69. That's you, Tricia. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. We've been busy. Um, so to provide some context in relation to this report, Council may recall that uh, two years ago, 
Haldeman Norfolk Housing Services started uh, participating in the two-year pilot project for the Survivors of Domestic Violence Portable Housing Benefit Program. And in that time frame, um, while well, over two years has passed, and based on a provincial evaluation, the Ministry of Housing has decided to roll out that pro program province-wide and, and roll it up. So what that means is they're proposing that the program be run province-wide in order that participants in the program have a truly portable housing benefit. They could move anywhere in the province. How the process is supposed to work is people would still apply through each service manager office. Um, we would review it, deem it eligible, and then forward it along to the Minister of, How um, Minister of Finance to approve it and issue the funding. The intention is that uh, survivors of domestic violence and uh, survivors of human trafficking would qualify for this portable housing benefit, and it would be used against uh, market rent. So somebody living somewhere with market rent could use this to make rent more affordable. And they would also be required to come off our central wait list as a special priority, thereby allowing other folks on the central wait list to move up quicker. Um, the province wasn't on time. It was supposed to roll out April 1st. So this report is for us to accept funding to run the program on their behalf for another quarter in hopes that it rolls out on July 1st and also to address the administrative funding that they're offering us, which is $250 per approved application. And I can answer any questions if needed. Questions? Ms. Gibbons? See any? Move in a seconder. Geisens? And Height. Councilor Geisens moves and Councilor Height seconds. There's a, a lengthy recommendation there. How be I not read it? I think it's about six paragraphs. You've all got it in front of you. I see some thumbs up, so that must be it's okay. Uh, those in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the next item on page 75 of the agenda package, and this is the terms of reference for the tele Telecommunications Advisory Committee. And I'm told by the Deputy Clerk that she is going to report on this item. Go for it. Thank you. Through the Chair, I am presenting Staff Report CAO 1813 on behalf of Andy Grizel. And between myself and the CAO, we can respond to questions of committee. I will also note that Councillor Height and the Mayor have often attended some of these meetings, so I'm sure that they'd be willing to answer some questions as well if there are. The initial terms of, the reference, terms of reference for the Telecommunications Advisory Committee were for approximately two years, so 2016-2017. However, the terms of reference specifically state that Council could review uh, the period and extend or modify it if, if so desired. The staff report is essentially seeking direction on whether or not to extend the mandate beyond the SWIFT project, um, and as outlined more specifically on page two of the report. This staff report was presented to the Telecation Advisory Committee on March 5, 2018. The committee unanimously carried the motion to support the staff report and to send it to Council as is. In summary, the report is twofold. One, to seek Council's wishes and continue uh, um, sorry, to seek Council's wishes with the continued role and mandate of the Advisory Committee, and two, to seek Council's wishes or direction on funding. And with that, we are happy to respond to questions. Questions to the Deputy Clerk? Yes, Councillor Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Stephanie, the uh, terms of reference as amended are attached. And that's good. But I didn't see any th reference in the actual terms of reference to the funding part and <coughs> covering the expenses of committee members to go to conference or whatever. Should that have been included in the terms of reference? Um, thank you. Through the chair, I, I will start with that, with responding to that. Unfortunately, I can't respond too much as I wasn't at the March 5th meeting. So perhaps Councillor Height, the CAO, or the mayor could respond further. My understanding is it was not in the terms of reference the proposed right. as we were not um, they were not sure as to if council would want to a continue the committee as is and I, my understanding is that they wanted to wait and see if the committee was going to continue past this with project and if that is the case then they would direct some funding if so desired so and that's fine I, I can accept that approach but would, would <laughs> 
Could it subsequently require an amendment to the terms of reference to allow for this committee to access funds for training or conferences? I think our uh, if they wish. County Administrative Officer is going to answer that. Uh, if I may, uh, I believe that the uh, thought process, at least among staff, was that a, a budget amendment that would provide funding to an operational area, in this case likely the IT department, but arguably it could be the clerk's department, um, would allow us to have some very modest but some source of funds so that anything approved by that committee, it, the goal is to avoid a long and overtly bureaucratic process. If a department has a modest amount of funding and there's approval with from a majority of your advisory committee, then they should be able to engage in very minor projects or attend very small, modest conferences or whatever the item happens to be. Um, so we, we were trying to avoid that outcome that uh, you're suggesting, Councillor, or to find a workaround. So they don't have to approve something, bring it here for you to approve for, for very, very modest spending, which is why we suggested the numbers that are in the report. I, I totally support having a budget for them. I just, I guess, from a strictly administrivia perspective, I thought in our other committees it did reference whether or not they were eligible to receive funding for expenses or travel or whatever. So that's, that's the only reason I'm asking the question. I support having it. Okay. Councillor Height, did, did you have anything to add with this report being that you're on the telecommunications committee? Certainly, Mr. Chair. I believe we just sort of earmarked some funds. I know we try to do everything over the web or electronically, so there hasn't been much of a need for funds, but should that arise, we might need something, you know, pens and paper or something if we choose to use those archaic devices. But even like uh, we had to call Bruce, we, we did it all through a teleconference and things like that. We did have the invite to go up there to talk to some of their, some other councils that are running in through a few things, and well, we didn't even have the funding for the mileage on that. So. I, I believe Mr. Cribbs wanted to put some loot in the goodie bag for us so we could do some more stuff. You know, one of the biggest drawbacks with this committee is that SWIFT is anything but SWIFT. And that's really what's holding us up or we'd be, you know, full steam ahead right now. I'm really hoping that we get a lot, a lot of the funding back that we put in for our fiber optic project and from there we could definitely roll out a lot more fiber throughout Norfolk. I was really happy to see ExecuLink took their own initiative with the money that we gave them and expanded down through Bill's Corners and Walsh and over to Port Dover. I think that, that was a really big push for Norfolk County to get a lot of fiber done in the most economical way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further, Mayor Luke. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, thank you. And certainly one of the meetings I attended, uh, this very discussion went on for some time as to the future of this group, and uh, Councillor Hyde is quite right. Um, Swift is uh, is coming, but it's 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 slowly coming, and that shouldn't surprise anyone. Uh, we knew from the onset that it would be a five-year uh, project uh, to get uh, things where we start to see the uh, the end result. Um, I think it's fair to say, and I'll and I'll ask uh, perhaps through the chair, if I may the county manager, that basically this is put before us to decide whether we value from here on in the, this committee, this extremely um, competent, extremely uh, high-skilled technical people here that are on it and very passionate to see the outcome of high-speed fiber internet throughout this entire county, no question. So I, I think it's fair to say, if I can ask the county manager, Mr. Chair, that if we want to see the continuation of this committee into the future, that we should be putting some funds in. And I don't say that they're going to, they're putting this up and holding it over our heads, but I think it's a fair statement that they feel they can be much more uh, serving of the county and be much more effective with a little bit of a budget to do certain things. Is that a fair statement? Thank you, Mr. County Manager. Or, sorry, Mr. CAO. That would be a fair statement. It's also, it would be appropriate to point out that this was a suggestion brought forth by staff as opposed to by the committee members itself. Um, there have been two instances. Uh, firstly, there, 
there was an idea band, bandied about the, the group as to whether or not we ought to sort of create some signage in some of our county-owned facilities that do allow for wireless. And with zero dollars, I mean, the thought was, well, we could repurpose uh, Parks and Rec funding. But you know what? That Parks and Rec funding is approved by council to perform specific tasks that are approved ultimately by the community. So that's not really appropriate either. So there have been two instances in the last year where having at least a few dollars would have made a real difference to some of the things that committee would like to do. Um, but uh, yes, in essence, uh, your decision today is whether or not you wish to continue on with the Technology Advisory Committee. As the report indicates, we can't point to many others in the province of Ontario, but we can also tell you, you have a dedicated group of people who have some skill and knowledge in an area that's not universally shared. And uh, for a pittance that may or may not be accessed, uh, we can continue to draw on their services. Yes, Mayor Luke. Would you like me to try a motion and then we can, I may not have any support and we can move from there. Okay. Do you have other speakers? I was looking at the recommendation that's printed on page uh, 75. Yeah. And, and that last paragraph is kind of awkward in there. Well, I was going to put something in there, Mr. Chair. Okay, were you? Okay, I, w well, I will. Uh... Mr. Chair, this is my rationale um, that I believe we should at least put in the $5,000 to the end of 2018, and then we have a budget process for 2019 for whatever number. But I, I would move the recommendation on page 75 and that the third um, statement say further that council provide funding of $5,000 to support this committee to the end of 2018. Okay. And that's a start. That's your, we'll that's your uh, recommendation. I need a seconder for that. Councillor Height seconds that. Now we'll open the floor for discussion. Councillor Wells. Well, could I ask the mayor where he thinks this $5,000 would be needed in uh, the next four months? Because you're only talking to the end of 2018, am I correct? Or did I misunderstand your motion? The, the motion was through the chair to Councillor Wells to the end of 2018, which is approximately seven months. It's just around half a year. Uh, you're asking what it's for. I know, as Councillor Hyde had said, they really wish to uh, have taken the hike up to, to Huron, where Huron has already done in their community what we hope to set up here. That is, when SWIFT comes in, to be able to, they have got service providers there. There were three of them put together, and I'm sorry, I don't have the names in front of me, but I did read the report from the teleconference, and they just feel that they have absolutely no money to even get in a vehicle and pay somebody's, somebody mileage to take them, them up there. And uh, as uh, the county manager has said, that some signs could go up about high-speed internet in some of our buildings and just things that they're looking at that they just feel that they need a few dollars to, to, to kind of pick this pace up a little bit, if I will. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other discussion? I'm going to get the... Uh, Deputy Clerk, to, to read it, as was presented by Mayor Luke. Through the chair, it's been moved by Councillor Mayor Luke and seconded by Councillor Height that report CAO 1813 be received as information and that Council approve the revised terms of reference for the Telecommunications Advisory Committee and further that Council provide funding of $5,000 to support the Telecommunications Advisory Committee to the end of 2018. Uh, sit well with you, Mayor Luke. Okay, any further discussion? Those in favor? That is carried unanimously. Thank you. Yes. Question while we're on this. I see that uh, reading the news media that we are getting uh, maybe some advancement in telecommunications in Port Dover. Uh, did this committee have anything to do with that? This is with respect to the ExecuLink expansion into Port Dover. Um, who can, can Brent, Brent, can you answer that please? Through the chair, indirectly, I would say that we have had some um, reasons for this happening um, because we had pushed for connectivity into the Port Rowan area. Uh, that provided them to provide additional expansion in further down into um, different areas, and, and Port Dover was one of their, always been one of the areas they wanted to get into. So indirectly, we have had some 
dealings with getting them into that area. So yes, ultimately yes. Okay. How about we do one more item and then we'll have our break. So this is with respect to page 85, it's the mass communication system. And uh, who's speaking on that one? I, I would be Mr. Chair. Bill Grindon? Yeah. Okay. I'm looking at uh, that. Speaking just before break, I will be brief, Council. Um, I'll take Council back to June of 2017 when um, this council and, and the Conservation Authority Board were, were struggling a bit with the official plan and development and uh, staff had come up with the safe access and egress um, solution we had thought that would, would help with the official plan review for coastal areas. However, as council knows, the um, province did not endorse the implementation of a mass communication system. However, staff had already set the wheels in motion for the RFP. Um, two things become very apparent as we went through the RFP process. The first was um, a mass communication system can, could do a lot, a lot of good for Norfolk, both internal communication and external wise. And it also came clear that we would need additional staff to properly utilize a system. Um, if, if I go to page two and three of the report, basically talk about the RFP process. Um, Everbridge Incorporated was the uh, successful candidate and if you go to page four you'll see it was a three-year deal you'll see the prices for each year um, if I bring your attention to mid mid page um, uh, page four uh, staff also in the fall of 2017 emergency management staff that is made application to the national disaster uh, mitigation program for funds which we'd hope would offset a mass communication system as of uh, 255 today I did finally get an email back that in principle Norfolk County was approved for upwards of thirty thousand dollars for this project the time of the writing report we didn't know how much money or um, if we were going to to be um, be approved uh, I still obviously it still has to be signed we still have some information to go back and forth so obviously we wouldn't get the thirty thousand dollars we only need twenty five thousand for the first year so that would be downgraded and I'm not sure of the details of, of where they else they may limit us with that said uh, senior staff and there were staff from uh, all divisions had had worked on this RFP are recommending that Norfolk County Council not go ahead with the um, with the approval of the RFP and it's simply based on to utilize this to its fullest, we, we do need uh, additional staff. The staff would be needed to, um, first of all, there's a lot of front end training and loading of information into the system. And then also once it's loaded up, up and running, uh, there is maintenance for years to come. As people come, uh, leave the area, come back in the area, the names have to be changed. So um, with that, I will turn it over to County Council for any questions they may have. Questions from committee, Councilor Height. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Mr. Cridlin. It says here in your first paragraph that the province did not endorse the implementation of a mass communication system as potential resolution for development concerns in coastal areas. This was to address the access and egress, as you know. And yet the province is saying it's still, still not good enough for them. How did they address that? Through, through the Chair of Council Height, if I can, I may... Um, um, pass this one over to Mr. Baird from, from the planning aspect. Uh, through, through the chair, um, the, the report we got back from the province just on that whole egress, we thought that that would form one part of a, of a plan that we could get provincial support to permit additional development in the Long Point area. Um, recall it had to do with uh, you know, doing some infrastructure upgrades, r raising the road whenever possible. Um, <clears throat> we had emergency planning. We had uh, uh, the mass communication piece that Mr. Cridlin's presenting. All of that, the hope was that the province could be convinced to support um, uh, this council's wishes and also the conservation authorities. Uh, when we did hear back from the province, they said no, that that, that, that they could not endorse that. So it kind of left this mass communication tool kind of in limbo. And I think uh, through the, the RFP process and the review afterwards, um, it was determined, you know, if, if, if we're not going to get the full benefit from it, and I, I don't want to get too far ahead of Mr. Cridlin's uh, presentation, but there are other tools now that have become available through um, Bell 
and, and other major carriers that will do emergency alerts, that sort of thing too. I'm not sure if you've heard of that lately. And, you know, is it still relevant at this point? So mm -hmm. with that, I'd turn it back to, to Bill. Uh, but certainly the province did not endorse a mass communication tool as an outright, um, you know, support for further development in that area. Okay, I'd like to see that, that real document because, you know, like this council has taken great steps and it's not about development, it's about protecting people in a time of flooding. And we've taken all the steps and the province has blocked us every step of the way. They have not been helpful one iota. They can gladly pay to raise that road two meters, three meters for all I care. Do something though. They have a park at the end that makes revenue every single year. They have two parks on Long Point, and so their people would be cut off if it was flooded anyway. We come up with solutions, thankfully through staff, and still nothing? Like, what are we supposed to do? It, the, the logic of raising the road is just not logical. They ask for that in the Lakeshore Management Plan to raise that in Turkey Point. Can you imagine you raise the roads in Turkey Point two meters? Everybody would have a pool on their yard. It's not even possible, yet the province doesn't actually offer you any help whatsoever. The mass communication system, I felt that, and I believe that this council felt it would solve our problem, as in, if there was an emergency, people would be notified and getting out, and got out. The national mitigation program obviously felt the same way, because they're offering us 30 Gs. Right? So, for me, I think I'd rather defer this, Mr. Cridlin, so you can come back with more on that funding opportunity. Give us some more details on that. You mentioned that staff do think that they have a use for this tool. Maybe we could dig a little deeper in that time. Because you have a lot of points in here where you think it would help the Corporation of Norfolk County. Or if there's another alternative, I don't say, I don't want to cancel the RFQ right now. Especially we have grant funding available where it's bought and paid for. So I'd like to move that we defer this for one month, if that works for you, Mr. Crillon. Through the Chair to Councillor Height. Uh, unfortunately, we, we do have a timeline. Uh, when the RFP was put together, uh, Ms. Darlington's not here to, to discuss, but I think I can do it justice, is that we had, we had 120 days from the time that the RFP was uh, first put out and um, I believe that 120 days is up on May 8th. So that was why we would have loved to put this report off a little farther into June when we knew about the funding. So I think what we risk is after 120 days, Everbridge, uh, I believe they can say that their, their, their price is no longer valid or they can come back and say it's, you know, we need X amount of dollars for it. So that's, that's the only thing I see with withholding um, or deferring this. Okay, I see on December 7th you open the bids, why did it take so long to come before council, thereby nullifying the bids? Through the chair, after opening of the bids, there were, um, the successful candidate did uh, two, I'll call them, uh, one was an interview and one, one was a presentation, and it took some time to get every, all the players together to, to view the supplementary information they, they brought through, and that, so that's, that's what took from December till, to, to now. Okay, I still think it's worth deferring. If, if Everlink or whatever that company was doesn't want the business, so be it. But I'm still moving the deferral. Okay, the county manager uh, has a comment. To, to be abundantly clear, um, this product has potential value to Norfolk County. We are what I like to refer to as sort of the awkward, in the awkward teenager phase. Were we smaller, this could not offer enough value. It would be too expensive or it would not offer enough value to us. Were we a lot larger, the business case would be self-evident. We are at an awkward population size and an awkward demand size. We do see considerable benefit in it. However, any decision that results in a purchase, that, and we do identify, at the end of the day, this is gonna come down to staffing. Within our current complement, this council could authorize the purchase of this product and it would have potential benefit for residents, for visitors, and for uh, operational use. However, if there's no staffing to come along with that, it will sit inert. 
It will not be supported, and it will have been the expenditure of public resources, as Councillor Wells earlier mentioned. Uh, ultimately, there's one taxpayer. This is money that would come from the federal government or primarily come from the federal government. But at the end of the day, based on our current uh, operational capacity, we would take this technology, we would deploy it, and there would be no way to maintain names and databases, its capacity to reach out, any of that. And so uh, there may well be benefit to this council to defer a decision, but if this council has to turn its mind, uh, we do not make any recommendation with regard to staffing, but we do bring up the issue in the report. And that is, at the end of the day, you need a human being. Now you, now you may ask to defer and ask for a further report back on what that could look like, and that might not mean a uh, permanent full-time position, it might be a part-time position, it might be a few hours a week, I, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but if the intention, if this council does not support the notion of at least some modest staffing increase, there's really no point in a deferral because we will come back and basically say the same thing. There, funding available, we can get a subsidized product, it does have some potential, but at the end of the day, we can't support it on our current staffing complement, and that's the major part of the rub. I just want to bring that to your attention, uh, and we'd respect any decision you make one way or the other. Thank you. Going back to Councillor Height, you had another comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. With all due respect, staff has had this report for four months. Four months. And I see that we're threatening that we need more staff, but we should have that information in this report. There, there should be how much will it cost. We went through the process of an RFQ. We went through the process of a grant application. Right? We've completed them both. And then in here, somewhere there's a little skinnible, we may require staff resources. How much is it? I don't know. Nobody knows. Four months worth, and we should know. Because if that was the case, maybe council wants to move it forward. Maybe we feel it is a valuable enough tool, considering that most of council supported this in the first place. Mr. CEO, do you have a further uh, clarification? Yeah, I just want to say, with all due respect, that's hardly a fair criticism of your staff. We've told you we've been, we've been working on this consistently and why it took this long. It's taken a lot of analysis. But what this council approved was spending money on a piece of technology. And were we to bring a report back to you that said, oh, we can buy the technology and ha-ha, we need a staff member, you'd have had a lot of grounds to be extremely angry with us and extremely disappointed. That's the Trojan horse way of pushing forward for new staffing. We did not do this. This is the intellectually honest and reasonable approach to provide you with information. We identify the issue inside. We make no recommendations. You're entirely justified in asking for more information on staffing, in saying, no, we reject that entirely, and going another way. But it would be completely inappropriate for us to get your approval to simply purchase some technology and come back and say, here's the technology. Now we need a whole staff member and to go forward like that. You need to be able to trust and rely on our honesty to give you the best advice we can and to not attempt to constantly empire build and expand the size of the civil service. You have, an you have a number of policy choices here. We can go with the system, we can not go with the system, we can look at going with the system in a modest way. But we have provided you with something that was straightforward and supported and we've provided information about what staffing might or, or at least identified the staffing issue. If you'd like a further report that examines that, we'd be very happy to do that. But we didn't feel we had a mandate to grow that, and so we most certainly did not. I saw a couple hands up. Councillor Oliver. Yeah, thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. I was supporting what Councillor Height was saying at first when he was just expressing his frustration about the ministry's rejection of our uh, plan that we put together last summer. But I, I don't share his sniping at staff regarding timing, et cetera. I think this report is entirely appropriate that it's coming forward to us the way it is. I do, however, uh, support what Councillor Height was saying relative to that report that came and that plan that came to Council last June. And eventually, several months later, we got a letter from m &R saying, no, we don't like it. Um, that was our plan, and as far as I'm concerned, it remains our plan and, and can, in fact, remain our emergency response plan relative to Port, or I should say Turkey Point and Long Point. I don't think we should allow the ministry going forward 
to do what they did to us last summer or fall, where they simply say, we reject it, and, and don't give us, as my colleague says, don't give us any other alternatives. So I certainly support the recommendation that's in this report. However, having done so, assuming we pass this, it would be my hope that if not our council, then the new council, as soon as it's in place, bring back that emergency plan that was produced. We spent 